Alex, just moments ago, we learned of two more attacks, rocket attacks and a drone attack against facilities housing U.S. troops in Syria that played out just over the course of the last few hours. First, a number of rockets were fired at the conical oil fields in central or eastern Syria, again, a facility that houses U.S. troops. That, according to a U.S. official, in that attack, one U.S. service member was injured but is in stable condition. Just a short time after that, three one-way UAVs, or suicide drones, attacked another facility, not too too far away, known as Green Village, also housing U.S. troops. According to the official, two of those three drones were shot down. The other did not injure uh, U.S. troops based at that facility or do damage to infrastructure. But this has all happened very quickly. Just within the course of the last 36 or 48 hours, these are this is now four attacks within Syria against bases and facilities housing U.S. troops. The question, of course, now, how does the U.S., how does the Biden administration respond to what is quickly escalating? <laughs> A late night strike in northeast Syria. Ambulances rushing to the scene as fire burns in the distance. The U.S. striking what officials say were ammunition depots and intelligence sites used by militias linked to Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. The U.S. called the strike, carried out by two F-15 fighters, a proportionate and deliberate action after a one-way drone attack killed an American contractor earlier Thursday near Hasaka in Syria. Five U.S. service members and another contractor were wounded in the attack. Early Friday morning, another U.S. base in Syria coming under attack from a barrage of 10 rockets, the Pentagon said, the U.S. placing the blame on Iran. Iran certainly, again, backs these groups uh, and by default, therefore, has a responsibility to ensure that they're not contributing to insecurity and stability, but clearly uh, they continue to do that. Syria has become a crossroads of conflict in the Middle East. Iranian proxies have carried out rocket and drone attacks against U.S. forces, and Russia has begun flying armed fighters over U.S. positions in the country. For the U.S. and its footprint of about 900 troops in Syria, the focus remains ISIS. We don't seek a war with Iran. We're not uh, looking for an armed conflict with that country or another war uh, in the region. We do seek to protect our mission in Syria, which is about defeating ISIS. On Thursday, the commander of U.S. Central Command, General Eric Carrilla, told a House Armed Services Committee hearing that Iran and its proxies have fired drones or rockets 78 times at U.S. forces since the beginning of 2021, nearly one attack every 10 days. So what Iran does to hide its hand is they use Iranian proxies. That's, uh, that's either UAVs or, or rockets to be able to attack our forces in either Iraq or Syria. Are, are these considered acts of war by Iran? They are being done by the Iranian proxies, is what I would tell you, Congressman. The U.S. has carried out attacks against Iranian proxies in Syria before, targeting either enemy infrastructure or launch vehicles used to attack U.S. forces. So just to review where the situation stands right now, within the last couple of hours, we have seen, again, two more attacks on facilities in Syria housing U.S. troops, a number of rockets launched at the Conoco oil fields, where there are troops based there, according to a U.S. official familiar with the intelligence about the attack. One service member was injured but is in stable condition. And then there were three one-way UAVs or suicide drones that were launched against another facility known as Green Village that also houses U.S. troops. Two of those drones were intercepted. A third damaged a facility there but did no injury uh, to U.S. troops who are stationed there. The question now, Alex, how does the Biden administration respond to this? General Eric Carrilla, the commander of U.S. Central Command, made it clear that if Iranian proxies continued to attack, the U.S. would very much reserve the right to respond and has options to do so. Let's bring in CNN Chief White House Correspondent Phil Mattingly. He is traveling with the president in Canada. Also joining us, CNN military analyst and retired Air Force Colonel Cedric Layton. Uh, Phil, first to you. Uh, the president did speak just before we learned this news about these latest attacks, about this U.S. service member who was injured. What is President Biden saying about what does appear to be a an escalating tit for tat? You know, Alex, this entire trip, while it certainly has been focused on the bilateral relationship between the U.S. and Canada, has faced the reality of this acceleration uh, with Iranian proxies since the very start. The president finding out about the initial attack uh, that killed an American contractor and wounded U.S. servicemen on his way here on Air Force One, was briefed about that, was provided options by the Pentagon, and made the decision to give the green light on the retaliatory strikes we saw last night, all while on his way to Canada. During that press conference, just a short while ago was when the report of that second and third attack just today came out. Now, when the president was asked about the initial attack, this was his response. Last night, U.S. military forces carried out a series of airstrikes in Syria, 
targeting those responsible for attacking our personnel. My heart and deepest condolences go out to the family of the American we lost and wish a speedy recovery for those who were wounded. To make no mistake, the United States does not, does not emphasize, seek conflict with Iran, but be prepared for us to act forcefully, protect our people. That's exactly what happened last night. And Alex, it's been notable U.S. officials throughout the course of the day making clear they do not want to escalate any type of situation or conflict with Iran directly, but they will respond if necessary. The question is, what defines if necessary? It has certainly been when U.S. troops have been attacked, injured, or killed. Uh, we'll have to see whether or not that's been the case with the latest attacks and whether or not that draws or drives a response from President Biden. Yeah, they don't want to escalate. But Colonel Layton, as you just heard from Orrin Lieberman at the Pentagon, four attacks in the past 24 hours. Now yet another uh, U.S. service uh, member who was who was wounded. How worried are you about this spiraling? Well, I think, uh, Alex, that it's a, a real risk. Uh, you know, the Iranians have used these proxies uh, for quite some time. And uh, the use of proxies is a way of allowing the Iranians to wash their hands of things. But it also means that they are not under direct control all the time of the Iranians. So they could be acting in a way that could exacerbate the situation and create some real problems. And that, I think, is something that we have to be concerned about. Yeah, that is a very important point. We don't know about the communication between Tehran and these Iranian-backed proxies. Uh, Phil, I want to go back to you and something you just mentioned. The administration is saying clearly, repeatedly, that they don't want escalation with Iran. But we have seen Iran ramping up this aggression, as well as its support for Russia and their war in Ukraine, providing those weapons. So more generally, for this administration, how much of a growing threat is Iran becoming? You know, Alex, and you know this area of the world quite well. I'm not sure it ever really left the table as a very significant threat, even if it hasn't been front of mind, certainly since the invasion of uh, Ukraine by Russia. But as you noted, the sheer number of drones and weapons capabilities that the Iranians have been providing to the Russians has been noted repeatedly by U.S. officials. Also keep in mind, it was just over the course of the last couple of weeks that it has become clear and very public just how rapidly uh, Iran has accelerated its ability to have that breakout period right now. And and how that shifts the context uh, or how U.S. officials approach this. They've made very clear their early stage efforts to get back into the Iran nuclear deal are no longer an option. They haven't laid out what actually comes next, but it's very clear uh, that this is moving back to front of mind and only seems to be accelerating based on what we've seen from their proxies, at least, over the course of the last 48 hours. All right, very worrying developments. Uh, Phil, Colonel Layton, I want you to stay with me. Uh, I want to bring in uh, CNN's Fareed Zakaria, the host of Fareed Zakaria, GPS. Uh, Fareed, thanks so much for joining us this evening. After this latest strike uh, on these U.S. forces, which again wounded at least one U.S. service member, how concerned are you about the possibility of escalation? Very concerned, uh, Alex. It, look, the situation is very, very dangerous, largely because the United States and Iran have the worst relations they, ha they have had in decades. And, you know, that's saying something because they've never had particularly good relations. But let me r remind us all of a little bit of historical context. If you go back just six or seven years and say, you know, the, the last years of the Obama administration, even the first year of the Trump administration, Iran was actually helping the United States defeat ISIS in Iraq. Iran was sending its militias to do that. It was adhering to the uh, nuclear deal. It was observing the limits. And the U.S. was in dialogue with it. Then Trump pulls out of the deal. Iran now sees itself in a box. Its economy is squeezed. It is desperate. And it is searching for ways to, in a sense, show that it has some capacity. Uh, and that capacity is largely for troublemaking. It is unleashing more of these militias over which, as even the U.S. government admits, it doesn't have perfect control. Um, and it's always played a, a, a nasty game with militias like Hezbollah and the ones in, in Syria. So the whole situation is one which Iran doesn't have a lot to gain from, uh, from stabilizing the situation. The United States entirely justifiably has to respond when its uh, forces are uh, threatened. But you put that all together and it's a powder keg. How much do you think that this is going to change U.S. priorities in the Middle East, Fareed, uh, especially as China and Russia try to expand their influence in the region? 
The Middle East has this effect, you know, it's like the line out of Godfather 3 when, when Michael Corleone says, I keep trying to get out of the family business and you keep pulling me back. Uh, the Middle East is, is like the, 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 that business, you know. The U.S. gets drawn back in because of things like this, violence, uh, violence against American soldiers, uh, instability. I, I, you can tell that the Biden administration is trying to keep this as, as calm and as in control precisely for the reason you're outlining it. The, the Biden administration believes it has bigger fish to fry, and strategically, that's exactly right. But there is a reality. Uh, if tactically things implode, if there is the optics of American soldiers under fire, the Biden people will have to do something. But so far, I think they're trying their best to maintain that focus.